Hello and welcome to the cardiovascular system. This is going to be the third section in our discussion on the human heart. And here we're going to look at two main ideas, uh, cardiac cycle and cardiac output. As always, we'll touch on some homeostatic imbalances and then we'll touch on uh, briefly on the development of the uh, human heart. So uh, here we are talking about this uh, cardiac cycle. And before we get into this, uh, keep in mind there's two major uh, generalities with the heart. And that is we want unidirectional movement. We want uh, blood moving through the chambers, uh, but not going in reverse. Uh, so uh, these opening and closing of these heart valves uh, ensures that blood moves in a forward direction uh, without the backflow. So by definition, uh, this cardiac cycle is all the events associated with blood flow through the heart during one complete uh, heartbeat. So this uh, cycle involves two major events, systole, and when we say that we talk about contraction of certain muscle tissues, and when we say diastole, we're talking about relaxation of certain uh, tissues. So in other words, uh, when a chamber of the heart contracts, that chamber is in systole. Uh, when the chamber of the heart relaxes, that heart chamber is in diastole. And again, we want blood moving in a unidirectional movement uh, through the chambers of the heart and out of the heart. And then we want, uh, well, generally speaking, how it functions is blood is moving from a region of higher pressure to a lower pressure. Um, I'm unsure if this video clip works. It's not part of the course material, but feel free to see if that YouTube clip uh, still functions. It might help you memorize it. Uh, here's a diagram uh, showing these general uh, patterns of movement of blood through the heart. And where is it in systole? Uh, where is it in diastole? So this is one complete cycle of the heart. Uh, keep in mind we could really jump in at any point of the cycle. Uh, but in this diagram, uh, we're jumping in here where it says a yellow start. We're going to go in depth into each and every one of these phases of the cardiac cycle. Uh, this diagram is a good overview of it, and it's a good uh, clip to, or I should say, a good slide to refer to, uh, jump back to when we talk about each and every one of these stages. Uh, so, in general, uh, the general notion of this uh, cardiac cycle is that a chamber that is in systole is going to push blood into a chamber that is in diastole, or that chamber might be pushing into a great arterial vessel, such as pulmonary trunk or maybe, maybe aorta. The majority of atrial emptying uh, does not involve systole, uh, but all a ventricular emptying involves a power, powerful systolic activity. And then again, in generally, generally speaking through this diagram, uh, the opening and closing of the valves involves pressure differentials across the valves. Again, remember that blood moves unidirectionally. Uh, therefore, when the pressure of the blood in a chamber exceeds the pressure in the next chamber, a valve opens and the blood comes rushing through. And then when the opposite occurs, then the valve closes. So when the pressure in the atria exceeds the pressure in the ventricles, the atrioventricle valves open, and when the, vent when the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in the atria, the atrioventricular valves close. So for example, in the lower right-hand corner, here we see the closing of those AV valves. Let's now look at a different step. When the right ventricular pressure exceeds the pressure in the pulmonary trunk, that pulmonary valve is then going to open and when the pressure in the pulmonary trunk exceeds the pressure in the right ventricle, the pulmonic valve closes. So let's go in depth into each and every one of these stages of the cycle. If this is going to work. There we go. No. Yes, here we go. Okay, so let's start out with phases of uh, cardiac cycle. We're going to begin uh, mid 
late diastole. So remember that this slide has an accompanying uh, slide showing these events in a graphic, a graphic way. So in this uh, ventricular filling, uh, the ventricles fill with blood. And this blood is coming from the atria. Uh, the proper term for this is going to be diastasis. Uh, diastasis. That's going to be blood flowing sort of passively from the atria. You just feel that way. And then there's going to be a contraction, an atrial systole, that's going to push that final 20% of the blood into the ventricles. And again, uh, we can see that happening in this ventricle filling diagram. So then after this passive uh, filling of the ventricles, we get our first sort of contraction event. And that's going to be atrial systole. And keep in mind that's going to be initiated by innervation from the SA node. Uh, in this process, uh, blood is sort of squeezed into those relaxed ventricles. Uh, again, remember that most of the blood entering the ventricles uh, actually occurred without this contraction. We have a new term to assimilate here, uh, end diastolic volume. Now that's going to be defined as the volume of blood in the ventricles after atrial systole. And eh, it's going to be roughly about 130 milliliters of blood. Uh, then the ventricles are preparing to uh, immediately contract. Uh, thus, they are filled as full as possible before this upcoming ventricular systole. Okay, so that now leads us to a ventricular systole. This is where the atria are now going to relax, and this is when the ventricles begin to contract. Uh, keep in mind, this is going to occur uh, from innervation from the AV node, leading down to bundle of His and then Purkinje fibers. Let's look at some smaller phases within uh, ventricular systole. We first have uh, in early uh, ventricular systole, this is called isovolumetric contraction phase. Uh, this is going to be the first stage of ventricular systole, and this is where the ventricles contract. They sort of squeeze, <clears throat> squeeze on that EDV, that end diastolic volume of blood. Well, the pressure in the ventricles quickly rises, and that's going to exceed the pressure in the atria. Thus, that's going to put some sort of backwards pressure on those atrioventricular valves, and that causes them to snap closed. Um, and again, that's because the ventricles are squeezing down on that volume of blood. Keep in mind that no blood has exited the ventricles yet. Uh, so then we move into a sort of ejection phase. Some people call it a late ventricular systole. Uh, this is when enough pressure is reached in those ventricles to exceed the pressure in the great arterial vessels. And because of this, blood is then pushed into the pulmonary trunk from the right ventricle. And then blood is pushed into the aorta from the left ventricle. We uh, arrive, and by the way, here's a diagram showing those uh, activities. We have a new term to assimilate now. That's going to be our end systolic volume. And that's going to be the volume of blood remaining in each ventricle. And so this is going to be at the end of the, of the ventricular systole. So at the end of this ventricular systole, we get a isovolumetric relaxation relaxation stage. And this is going to be a brief period uh, when volume in those ventricles does not change. It causes a brief sort of uh, pause and pressure drops and SL valves uh, close. Along the same lines we get what's called a stroke volume. And uh, this stroke volume is going to be referred to the volume of blood ejected during ventricular ejection. This is the amount of blood ejected during one stroke, in other words, one cardiocycle of the heart. <clears throat> of the heart pardon. And uh, generally speaking, this uh, stroke volume is approximately uh, 70 milliliters of volume. 
that is 70 million liters of volume per beat. So when while ventricles were in systole, those atria were relaxing, they were in diastole, but however, they were still filling with blood at that moment, because remember that there's multiple events happening within this one cycle at any given moment. The atrial pressure rises and AV valves will be forced open to once again repeat that phase. And again, here is showing that final phase, the isovolumetric relaxation. So on this last slide, uh, we put all of those phases together and kind of stitch them together, and we see a sort of summary of this cardiac. Generally speaking, this cycle is about 0 0.8 seconds long, whereas 0 0.1 of those seconds is taken up by atrial systole, 0 0.3 of those seconds is uh, taken up by a ventricle uh, systole, and 0 0.4 seconds is a sort of quiescent period, a sort of pause in between where the cycle repeats. On this di diagram, uh, notice on the upper part, we have an ECG tracing. So in the last section, we talked about P waves, we talked about QRS complex, and we talked about a T wave. Also, we talked about heart sounds as well. The next graph below that shows uh, pressure related to each event. Uh, so for example, uh, notice in this a dark blue, this darker blue line, this represents the pressure in the left ventricle. Notice how the pressure in the left ventricle rises dramatically corresponding with a peak in the QRS wave in the electrocardiogram. Also, we see that at the same time, we're talking about ventricular volume. In our discussion, we talked about EDV and ESV. Here we see that at those uh, at EDV, the ventricles are filled up entirely, and when that pressure gets so great, the valves open and the volume of blood in the ventricles is released through the rest of the systemic circuit. Here we see stroke volume shown as that difference between EDV and ESV. Here after ESV, we see that the uh, ventricles have uh, very little volume as they slowly fill up once again and the cycle repeats. Lastly, notice that in this diagram we see how activity is of AV valves are tracked along with it and activity of uh, artic, I'm sorry, aortic and pulmonary valves is tracked along with this. Furthermore, at the bottom we see how um, blood moves in a certain manner according to these cycles all tied together. So in summary, there's a connection between ECG, the pressure in those chambers, the volume of blood in those chambers, and what's happening to the valves, and that one-way movement of blood. So lastly, uh, just to uh, touch on some general uh, ventricular pressures, uh, keep in mind that this, these ventricles uh, have thicker myocardia. Recall that the atria have thinner myocardia. So therefore, we're going to get a certain blood pressure in the aorta, aorta that's about 120 millimeters of mercury. And then blood pressure in the pulmonary trunk is going to be about 30 millimeters of mercury. Recall from the last section that the volume of blood ejected from each ventricle is approximately uh, 70 milliliters of volume. That's also going to be kind of called our stroke volume. So recall that our right ventricle is going to be taking blood up to the pulmonary circuit to get that blood oxygenated. And then that left ventricle is going to be taking blood to the systemic circuit. And both of those volumes need to be the same. So one might ask, uh, why do uh, st both stroke volumes for each ventricle uh, need, to be, <coughs> sorry, need to be the same? And that's because uh, having unequal blood uh, could lead to some problems. Um, if we had sustained pumping of unequal amounts of blood, that might result in edema. Edema is a sort of swelling, and that's when excess fluid accumulates or builds up in the interstitial space or within cells.
We now turn our attention to another main topic in the uh, heart discussion, and that is cardiac output. This heart we've been talking about uh, does not always put out the same amount of uh, blood. And that's because the body's need for oxygen varies with the level of activity. So for example, if we are lethargic, perhaps and laying on the couch, our muscle and tissue is not going to need a lot of oxygen. But if we are running or jogging or perhaps doing a high cardiovascular activity, we're going to have a large need for oxygen in that muscle and tissue. So uh, body cells need specific amounts of blood each minute to maintain health and life. We would say that a cardiac output is a sort of measurement of how effective the heart is in pumping blood to the body in order to fulfill that transport function. Uh, notice that cardiac output uh, should be equal to stroke volume. And uh, so therefore, uh, we say that uh, we have a volume, uh, I'm sorry, an equation that says CO equals stroke volume times the heart rate. That's the multiplier there. And another term we have in this slide is cardiac reserve. Cardiac reserve is a sort of ratio between the maximum cardiac output a person can achieve and that cardiac output at rest. So this uh, resting, uh, resting cardiac output, that's going to be a function of heart rate and stroke volume. But remember that the value of one is going to influence the other. And we can see that in that equation. Uh, by the way, individuals uh, with smaller ventricular chambers, they're going to need a, a faster heart rate since less stroke volume can be ejected. So for example, we see uh, faster heart rates in women and we see faster heart rates in newborn children. As we mentioned earlier, we can uh, do some mathematics with uh, cardiac output. So again, in this slide, uh, we show that equation. So this cardiac output, CO that is, is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume, SV in other words. Uh, this uh, units for cardiac output is going to be in terms of milliliters per minute. The heart rate is going to be in terms of beats per minute. And the stroke volume is going to be in terms of uh, milliliters per beat. And so therefore, uh, since this uh, normal resting rate is around 75 beats per minute, and normal stroke volume is approximately 70 milliliters, uh, we crunch little numbers and do a little math. Uh, cardiac output is roughly 5.25 liters of blood per minute. So uh, that's a shocking statistic. That means the entire blood supply of the human body uh, passes through the cardiovascular system every minute. Well, in this diagram, we show uh, some high uh, exercise, some uh, well-trained athletes, so to speak. Uh, it's noteworthy that well-trained athletes generally have strong muscular hearts. Uh, that is, they can force more blood out during ventricular ejection. And because of that, their resting heart rate generally tends to be lower due to more effective stroke volumes. So this cardiac reserve that we talked about a little bit ago is a sort of, remember that's an increase in the cardiac output above its level at rest. And we can determine this by subtracting a cardiac, cardiac output at rest from the cardiac output during exercise. And so during this extensive physical activity, uh, an increase in cardiac output is required. So thus, we have a need for a sort of cardiac reserve. And so therefore, cardiac output can be increased by an increase in the heart rate or in, an increase in stroke volume. As a result of this, the ventricles are now contracting more forcefully. Uh, now we start sort of uh, dissecting uh, that equation we talked about. Uh, so recall that cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate. And in this diagram, we see heart rate shown on lookers right. And on the left, 
we hear a stroke volume, but in this diagram we see that uh, stroke volume is influenced by three uh, main factors. In this diagram, they call it preload, uh, contractility, and then afterload. I think our McKinley textbook is calling a preload a quote-unquote venous return uh, contractility that's influenced by inotropic agents, uh, chemicals, in other words. So we're going to go in depth then now and look at these. We're going to look at some uh, variables that influence uh, this heart rate. This preload can be thought of as a sort of effect of the stretching. In other words, uh, there's a certain amount of pressure placed on the walls of the heart. So when the ventricles fill up with blood, that causes the walls of the ventricles to stretch. Uh, this tension is then placed on those ventricle walls. That's what we're talking about when we say preload. So the preload, and, and, oh, by the way, in other words, more, mes uh, more muscle that gets stretched, the greater the force of contraction, the greater the amount of tension there is. And if we have uh, more blood, then we get more force of contraction. So this preload on the heart is one factor that determines the force of ventricular contraction. And this, this is sort of explained by this event called the Frank-Starling uh, Law of the Heart. And that states that uh, the greater the preload of the heart, that is the amount of ventricular stretch, the stronger the cardiac muscles will contract to eject the blood. And we see that in the diagram on the right. Uh, on the x-axis, we see a sort of a fiber length of the myocardia. And on the y-axis, we see ventricular pressure. Another way to influence uh, stroke volume is going to be contractility. In other words, uh, inotropic agents. So let's start off with a definition for what we mean by contractility. So contractility is referring to the contractile strength at any given muscle length. So contractile meaning the contraction. So <clears throat> these things called inotropic agents are going to be external factors that can alter this contractility of the heart. And so we see here that we're talking about things like autonomic nerves, things like hormones, can be an external agent that affect the stroke volume. Things like calcium or potassium levels can all be inotropic agents. Uh, positive inotropic agents increase contractility, and then negative inotropic agents decrease contractivity. Uh, so for example, the availability of calcium in the cardiac muscle cell sarcoplasm is the main factor associated with inotropic action. And so other uh, inotropic agents include things like epinephrine or norepinephrine. Uh, those are examples of positive inotropic agents. And things like negative inotropic agents, again, these things are going to decrease cardiac contractility, are things like elevated potassium levels. And that's where as the calcium channels get blocked, and certain medications can do a certain things like this. And then a third influence on stroke volume is going to be what's termed afterload. We might define afterload as the resistance in the great arteries. That's a, a sort of resistance to the ejection of blood from the ventricles. And uh, so in order for this ventricle chamber to eject the blood out of there, uh, and again, this is coming out of the left ventricle into the greater vesicle uh, vessels, this afterload must be overcome, so to speak. Uh, and by the way, high blood pressure, a homeostatic imbalance, is going to reduce stroke volume. Hypertension, in other words. Hypertension can increase afterload on the heart. So in summary, uh, stroke volume can be affected by preload, contractility, and afterload then the heart rate can influence this, and then lastly, that results in a cardiac output.
So let's talk about then uh, how we might regulate this heartbeat. I notice in this diagram, the person is taking a pulse. Uh, to me, that looks like they're taking a pulse at radial artery. And uh, let's see, we talked earlier about certain positive and negative factors. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic influences do have a regulation on heartbeat. Uh, recall that a vagus nerve uh, can innervate with uh, nodes on the heart, and that's going to speed up or slow down that heart rate. Also, chemical regulation. When we say things like hormones and ions, hormones like epinephrine and norepinephrine can increase heart rate. And then lastly, things like age, gender, and exercise can also affect the frequency of that heartbeat. Here we have a slide that talks about that one factor, that one factor called exercise. And uh, it's generally supported that a person's health of their cardiovascular system can indeed be improved with a regular exercise. Uh, specifically, we believe aerobic exercise tends to increase cardiac output and elevate metabolic rate. So when we say aerobic exercise, we're talking about things that in involve a lot of breathing, uh, working large groups of muscles for at least 20 minutes a time, three to five times a week. Uh, several weeks of training results in maximal cardiac output. And uh, as a side note, it's interesting to note that regular exercise can decrease anxiety and depression and also control weight. So it's a win-win situation where uh, even further longer sustained exercise increases uh, oxygen demand uh, in the muscles. Conversely, uh, the opposite can happen. Uh, when the heart collapses or fails, or we have a homeostatic imbalance, a person's mobility decreases. We have uh, ways to fix this. Uh, perhaps a heart transplant might help such individuals. Uh, also, uh, other pacemakers that we talked about in this course can also improve the output of the heart. So this diagram is just sort of a general summary of cardiac output. So keep in mind we're looking at the purple box here, the increased cardiac output. Recall that cardiac output is equal to heart rate times the stroke volume, so therefore cardiac output can be affected by changes in heart rate and or changes in stroke volume. So notice here in blue box we have an increase in heart rate in red box, we have an increase in stroke volume. Recall that we talked about factors that increase or decrease heart rate. Um, and then also recall that we talked about things like, again, things like the nervous system uh, can increase heart rate. Uh, chemicals like hormones can increase heart rate, age, and other factors, etc. cetera. Uh, recall that stroke volume is affected by preload, contractility, and afterload. So we put it all together, uh, we get a certain amount of cardiac output. Again, that's always variable and always uh, ever-changing to meet the demands by the tissues in the human body. As always, we visit uh, homeostatic imbalances in cardiac output. Uh, we have risk factors associated with cardiac output, things like high blood cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, things like cigarette smoking, obesity, uh, lack of exercise, these are all risk factors for affecting that cardiac output. Other smaller factors include diabetes, a certain genetic predisposition. Uh, some evidence suggests that even uh, the male gender, uh, being male, can give you a risk of imbalance in your cardiac output. And one of those examples is congestive heart failure. We see that congestive heart failure is a chronic or acute state that results when the heart is not capable of supplying the oxygen demands of the body. Uh, what might cause congestive heart failure? Uh, coronary atherosclerosis. So for example, narrowing of the arteries. Things like hypertension, meaning blood pressure, higher blood pressure, uh, valve disorders, congenital defects, things we're genetically born with, these can all lead to congestive heart failure. Sometimes uh, different sides of the heart fail. 
uh, in left side heart failure. Recall that this left ventricle has the job of supplying the systemic circuit with nutrients and ox oxygen. Uh, if we get a left side failure, uh, more blood remains in that uh, left ventricle. And because we have an inequality in the pump, therefore blood is going to back up into the lungs and we have pulmonary edema that might occur. Then when, uh, if let's say the right side of the heart failed, recall that that right side of the heart, and again, this is patients, this is anatomical right of the, of the diagram. If the right side failed, that would not be sending blood up to the pulmonary circuit, the lungs. And therefore, again, we would have an imbalance and uh, too much tissue, or I'm sorry, too much fluid would build up in the tissues in the systemic circuit. We would have peripheral edema. Related to this is a coronary art disease. Uh, here we have a transverse cross section of an artery. Uh, we can see that it should be open and allowing the flow of blood, but here we have this plaque, this sort of a buildup of uh, fatty deposits on the walls of the arteries. So uh, what causes, what happens then is after this narrowing of the vessels, this heart muscle is going to be receiving an insufficient uh, blood supply. We can treat uh, this uh, coronary art disease. Uh, one way to do that is through drugs, and so recall that certain chemicals can affect coronary output, and others include a bypass graft, uh, angioplasty, or a stent. Let's take a look at some of those. In this diagram, we see uh, what's called a bypass graft. Oops. So notice that here we have one of the coronary arteries, and in yellow, we're trying to show an obstruction. That obstruction could be some fatty deposits or some plaque on the walls of the artery. When they say grafted vessel, that means they've taken this vessel from somewhere else in the human body, extracted it out, and then gone into the heart and sort of uh, bypassed that uh, blocked artery. So when people talk about a double bypass heart surgery, that means they're bypassing two of the five arteries that surround the heart. A triple bypass is where they're uh, bypassing three of those arteries, and you get the idea. A quintuple bypass surgery would be bypassing all five of those coronary arteries. Last list, I'm sorry, lastly, we look at a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. Uh, what are we talking about with that? Uh, that in the upper left-hand corner we see is, again, uh, we're talking about atherosclerosis as a problem. And again, this is referring to fatty deposits or plaque on the walls of arteries. One way to uh, work against this is to insert a deflated balloon. It's sort of incredibly small and threaded into the obstructed area. And then that balloon becomes inflated. Uh, that's going to stretch that arterial wall and also it sort of squashes the atherosclerotic plaque. We deflate that balloon and then we pull that out and hopefully that lumen of the blood vessel is wider and now increased amounts of blood can flow through that artery. And then another way to strengthen that wall of the artery is to put a sort of stent into that artery. This is a artificial uh, structure that's gonna provide structure to that blood vessel wall so that it does not collapse anymore and it does not occlude that artery. The last thing we talk about in the heart is a brief one, and that is the development of the heart. In other words, how does it develop uh, from uh, fertilization uh, to fetus uh, to newborn? So we see that these days in this diagram are days after conception. Uh, this heart develops from uh, stuff called mesoderm uh, before the end of the third week of gestation. And then we're going to get these things called endothelial tubes that then evolve into a four-chambered heart, generally speaking. So what's happening then is in this first diagram, the uh, looker's left, is going to be the fusion of two heart tubes merging. And then this tube is going to sort of bend and it's going to fold upon itself 
and it's going to form uh, the general external heart shape. Then as the days go on, uh, we have expansions begin to form in that tube. We have the forming of four postnatal heart structures. And then as time moves on, we have this structure called the bulbous cordis. This bulbous cordis is going to subdivide and start forming part of the right ventricle. And then uh, a structure called the conus cordis is then going to start forming our uh, left ventricle. And uh, then a structure called the truncus arteriosus is going to form an ascending aorta and a pulmonary trunk. Uh, then we get a sort of partitioning into four chambers. And then lastly, uh, the great vessels form. And we, call, we recall earlier that uh, we also have a bypass circuit installed in this uh, heart as well. Uh, the foramen ovale allows blood to bypass the lungs in fetal life. And because, remember, the fetus then obtains its oxygen from the umbilical, um, part, I'm sorry, <clears throat> the umbilical cord instead. Upon uh, birth, that uh, hole, that structure, then occludes and then becomes a basin, a fossa, so to speak. Well, that concludes our discussion on the heart. And uh, that also concludes our material for the heart and the blood. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about in the course is going to be the vessels, the vessels that come off of this heart. As always, make sure to keep up with your course readings. And if any of the material is challenging or you'd like a closer look at it, as always, please jump into your textbook for more in-depth explanation. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.